Okay, Angie. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Economic Outlook webinar. We will get started in just a minute to give our guests a few more seconds to log in. All right, I think we will get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Angie Whitcomb. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce, and we are thrilled to have you join us for our 2021 Economic Outlook webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping details. This is a webinar format, so our guests do not have audio or video capabilities, but we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A bar below. We will have plenty of time for questions once the presentation is done. You can communicate with the hosts using your chat feature. We are recording this webinar and you will be sent the link after the event. Today's webinar is sponsored by US Bank and our coffee sponsor is Starbucks. So even though we can't be together to enjoy breakfast, Starbucks has generously provided $5 gift cards to everyone who is attending today's event. The gift cards will be mailed out to you afterwards. And so we wanna thank both US Bank and Starbucks for their generous support of our webinar. Now onto the program. Today's presenter is back with us again by popular demand for the fourth year. Our presenter is Tom Hanlon, CFA, the National Investment Strategist for US Bank Wealth Management. Tom is a member of US Bank Wealth Management's senior investment leadership team that directs overall investment strategy, asset allocation research, and investment vehicle and security selection across all of their wealth management organizations. He leads a team of analysts that provide global, macroeconomic, and capital market research and trend analysis through a disciplined, repeatable, data-driven approach. Additionally, the group provides domestic and foreign policy analysis in order to distill global, economic, capital market, and political complexities into implementable, actionable investment views. Tom also heads up the thematic investing research discipline, studying world economic and political events, as well as social, technological, and environmental developments in order to identify global trends that may offer long-term investors a strategic performance potential. Tom has more than 20 years of experience analyzing economies, accessing capital markets, and managing investment portfolios for families and individual private wealth investors. And he's developed a network of key international relationships across Europe, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. He's been quoted in national and international media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg Radio, CNBC, and Reuters. And we're thrilled to have him join us today. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Angie. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for for joining this morning. It's uh, it's always a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, be here with you. Yes, it's it's uh, this has been a number of years now that we've been able to uh, to get together and hopefully just share with you a little bit of our our work on the economy and on policy and on the markets and what we see for for 2021. We were we were talking earlier about um, what it'd be like to go back uh, back a year in time and and listen to last year's 
last year's message and see how uh, see how that turned out in in, uh, in 2020. But yeah, so uh, as Angie mentioned, I work at U.S. Bank. Um, I've been in the financial services industry for 23 years. But more importantly, I'm uh, I'm a lifelong member and resident uh, of uh, of, the, of the Twin West region. I was born and raised in the region. I went to Cedar Island Elementary School in Maple Grove and and Northview uh, Junior High in Brooklyn Park and Osseo High School. And and I'm a, a third generation graduate of the University of Minnesota. Uh, my fourth generation uh, is now attending the U. Um, I've got uh, we're a blending family. I've got five uh, children, three of whom are now in college, and two of them are still at Wyzetta High School where I hear that uh, perhaps on April 1st, they may be going back to school full time uh, in person. So we will, uh, we will see that will be a tremendous progress uh, for, uh, for the kids and for, uh, for our, uh, our one graduate this year from Aussie, from his uh, high school. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, unfortunately, we've had some, some technological challenges. So Andrea is going to be, uh, be very patient with me and help move the slides forward. Cause normally I drive and, uh, um, I'm not the best driver in terms of uh, the PowerPoint slides, but we've got some visuals to to uh, to share with you so you can kind of see and follow along what what we're seeing. And and Andrew, if you want to just move the slide ahead forward one, please. So this is a bit of a a, a way that we frame things coming into 2021. We put this together last late last year about how we see the year unfolding. And these are these are kind of stages of of development. They're they're not isolated. They they will overlap each other. Um, but based on, but basically the election, where we are with COVID spread and distribution of vaccine and, and vaccination throughput, um, the, where we are with uh, the Biden administration's uh, first 100 day agenda, that's kind of where the, it's kind of two through four is where we are right now. And then the, the key question for us in, in the back half of 2021 and even looking forward into 2022 as best we can is, what does the steady state look like that, that follows once we get through uh, to a certain level of vaccine throughput, once we perhaps achieve some form of herd immunity and can reopen the economy? As I said, maybe the, the kids can go back to school in April, see what things look like in the summertime. And then what is what is back to school 2021 look like? What do consumer and business and state and local government uh, uh, trends look like in the, in the back half of the year? So that's a key of, of our focus is Two through four is kind of where we are right now. Five is where we see ourselves in, in the future. And it's a key question of what does the economic growth scenario look like? What do consumer and business trends look like? So Andrew, if you don't mind like, moving forward a slide. To, uh, to give you a little bit of a preview of, of the message for today, um, our perspective coming into 2021 is we're, we're, we have what we call this, this glass half full uh, perspective, meaning we, we understand the risks in front of us, we understand the risks of, of policy missteps, or we appreciate the risks of, of um, back, virus mutation that challenges the current uh, development of vaccines. We appreciate the risks of uh, vaccination throughput, which have been very challenged in Europe, um, uh, challenged somewhat here in the United States and less so in, in areas of the world like Israel that have had a great amount of throughput. But taking a look at those risks relative to the support we see ongoing from the Federal Reserve in terms of monetary policy report, support, the, uh, the effects of the, the, the latest round of fiscal support and the potential for additional fiscal support, and our optimism about where we are with, with vaccine development and vaccinations. Um, for us, we've had this glass half full outlook for, for, uh, for 2021. Again, the second half is, is, is very key because that's, uh, you know, we get through the first half of the year where the comparisons with, with 2020 are fairly easy. The economy had shut down pretty completely in the first half of last year. So any growth in the economy now this year is gonna look uh, you know, outstanding relative to last year. But again, what does that steady state look, look for? And, and we're very keenly focused now on what does uh, the government policy look like with, with the Biden administration? What does tax policy look like? Um, what does the stimulus look like? We know we've got um, you know, some parallel processes in Congress about the next round of stimulus. And then what's the regulatory environment look like and how does that affect certain sectors of the economy? But in general, um, as I said, we've got this modestly optimistic outlook for, for 2021, both in terms of the economy and then in terms of capital markets. Our, our, our purview, um, our group is, is our task with studying the virus and vaccines, studying government policy, studying the economy and capital markets to formulate what we think is an investment strategy that, that gives our clients 
the highest probability of achieving their financial goals. And so for us, for 2021, it's been this, this very cautious but moderate uh, risk-taking, uh, slightly slightly out on the spectrum a little bit with this slightly optimistic outlook for, for 2021. Um, and if you don't mind moving forward a slide. Looking back, I mean, so if we sat at, at, at uh, where we were when we, when we met last, I think we were at the Hilde uh, Center in, in Plymouth for, for last year's presentation. Um, here we were, um, you know, at, at sort of that top of that little peak where it says February 1st, 2020. Um, if we had known ahead of time that uh, we'd, we'd have this global pandemic and that, you know, restaurants would still be, you know, two thirds closed at this point and traffic on uh, mass transportation across the country would still be about two thirds, you know, a third of what it normally is and airline traffic about the same and that the stock market would lose a third of its value in 23 trading days between February and March. Um, I don't know that we would have expected that we would have ended the year at all time highs in the, in the stock market, but that's that's where we are today. And, and that's that's part on um, the fact that the stock market's a forward looking mechanism. It looks past uh, these these perhaps temporary but, but significant dislocations and looks at the path forward. Um, and it, it appreciates that that economic systems repair themselves through time, despite these significant disruptions that we've seen over time, whether it's the global financial crisis, the 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 tech wreck back in the 2000s or the, or the current uh, uh, COVID-related economic impact that we've, we've seen this year. But it's also reflective of where we are in terms of interest rates and, and the value of cash flows that are discounted into the present future cash flows. And when interest rates are low or, or they're negative when you take into account inflation, those, those future cash flows, no matter how modest they might be, um, become incredibly valuable. So that's what's helped support what we've seen going on in the stock market, despite COVID's onset, despite the, the restrictions on the economy, despite the level of unemployment we continue to have. Um, the, the market continues to discount a, a somewhat optimistic future where we, where we have this economic repair and then those cash flows in the future are very valuable in, in today's environment of low interest rates. Um, Andy, the next slide. Um, so we've seen this, this positive performance. 2020 is what, uh, what we ended up with after our last meeting. And again, the areas of the economy that we're, we're continue to be severely impacted, and we see that in, a little bit in our region in North Dakota, which would be what happened with oil prices, although they've been rebounding now as we started the year, and real estate, which I'll touch on a little bit um, at the end, but we get a lot of questions on real estate and happy to answer um, uh, any, any thoughts or questions or considerations we have, because it's obviously a, a very important sector of the economy. And, and again, looking into what, what a recovery looks like and, and what real estate trends is, is very important and, and something that we spend quite a bit of time on. So Andrew, if you want to fast forward to slide, uh, slide seven, we can go all the way there. Um, in general, going looking forward, we've, our perspective has been that, that economic growth in the United States um, will just continue to, to, uh, to slow through time. And that's partly because of our demographics, partly because of the growth of our population or our working age population, and part of function of, of the continued uh, slowdown in the use of credit. You know, we've, we hear about a lot about the Federal Reserve and their, their impact in the, in the economy and how much money that they've added through, through bond purchases, but the multiplier of that money via the use of credit just continues to, to slow down through time. And this has been a key feature of why we haven't seen material inflation in the United States, despite, despite all, the, all the moves by the Federal Reserve and the CARES Act and all the fiscal policy actions, in part because we've just not seen that, that, uh, that regrowth in, in the, the use of credit, which then multiplies the, the money supply in the United States and ultimately can create that excess demand relative to what we can sp supply. And that's, that's the, 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 uh, the, the long-term driver of inflation. And if you want to fast forward a slide, please. So we have an environment right now where despite this tiny little uptick, we've seen in interest rates where 10-year treasuries are now above a little bit above 1%. But you can just see historically that the cost of capital in the United States remains incredibly low. So this has been a key feature of how the government continues to finance itself and how we can have the kind of budget deficits we have because the interest payments are so are so low. It's almost like the, the world's largest Best Buy program of, of uh, no interest loans for, for 10 or 30 years. Uh, but relative to history, the government, state and local governments, corporations have been able to refinance themselves at, at incredibly low low prices. And, and the, for us, um, if we were to look at a risk in the, in, the, in the capital markets or a risk in the economy, it's we see a, a uh, not gradual, but maybe a rapid shift upward in the in the cost of interest you know, in the interest cost 
for governments and for, for corporations, and that would impede this economic recovery hub. We haven't seen it yet. That would be uh, in part a response if, if, uh, borrower, or if, if the United States as a borrower were, were asked by, by, uh, by foreign governments or other consumers of our debt and buyers of our debt for higher interest payments uh, to, you know, because of a, of a worry that we weren't able to pay them back or the strength of our economy. For right now, we've been able to finance the government at 1% interest for, for 10 years, and we haven't seen that. But that's, that's kind of where we're looking for, for the potential for risk in the system. Um, Andrew, we can fast forward two slides. Um, there's a lot of negative yielding debt in the world, but if you subtract from the interest rate, the, uh, the level of inflation in this country, this is, this is why we have what we call negative interest rates in our, in our economy. So this is incredibly stimulative when you can borrow nominally at 1%, but inflation is running higher than 1%. So you can grow your business through time and pay back those, that interest expense. Um, with with inflated dollars and, and inflated uh, sales of goods and services. So this has been one of the key reasons why the stock market has, has continued to push higher on, and valuations of companies have continued to push higher because, of, as I said, the the value of those future cash flows discounted at a negative interest rate is, is technically infinite, but we, we know that that's not, uh, that's not possible. But any, any company that can generate a, a positive earnings cash flow and positive dividend yield when discounted at a negative uh, interest rate that you might get from, from investing in a, in a short-term or even a long-term government uh, bond becomes very attractive. Next slide, uh, and Andrea, on, on 11, the, the, uh, the Federal Reserve is not the only game in town. The, the, the central banks around the world, you can see that inflection point back in, in 2020 and in, in, in March or so where the central banks globally all step back into their economies and, and even into the capital markets and buying securities. Um, and, and what we, we believe is that this is a pretty durable feature of the economy, that, that, the, that the monetary authorities will probably be one of some of the slowest to pull back on stimulus. The Federal Reserve has been very clear that they don't see interest rates rising anytime with, until at least 2023. So we've got this runway where we, we believe we've got very low interest rates, strong presence of the monetary uh, policy authorities, whether it's the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank or the other major central banks around the world, keeping interest rates low and, and, and making, maintaining this incredibly high level of monetary support in the economy. The next slide just shows that as far as, far as right now, we haven't seen any stress um, even despite what we see in the constraints of a, of a, of a, of a partially reopened economy, this, the challenges we have in the service sector and particularly the face-to-face -face service sector. But if you look at the, the borrowing costs of, of what, uh, what are called high yield or what used to be called in the, in the Mike Milken days, junk bonds, um, even, even borrowers that are seen, seen as riskier by companies like Moody's and, and, and S&P are able to finance themselves at incredibly low interest rates relative to history. So the borrowing costs for, for, for uh, riskier companies in the public market are very low. And on the next slide, we'll see that, that the, the borrowing costs, this is actually not, a, not a, a, an interest rate, but it's, a, it's an index level. So as this rises, it indicates that things are, are still pretty, pretty sanguine in what's called the leveraged loan market, which is the bank loan market. So companies that can't finance themselves through through uh, the issues of bonds, but they have to go to banks. Um, we're not seeing stress there. And, we're, and, and despite the challenges of, of retail and hotel and other parts of the hospitality industry and real estate, we haven't seen that stress yet in the, in the commercial mortgage-backed security market yet. So these are areas of key areas of focus for us. But for right now, we've seen that the, the stance of the Federal Reserve, the benefits of, uh, that the economies received from things like the CARES Act, continue to bridge us financially until we can get to this reopening perhaps in the, in the back half of, of 2021. So uh, Andrew, if we can fast forward all the way to slide 16, um, as, as we mentioned, that's, that's kind of our framework. And the catalyst that we're looking for, obviously, as I said, we're two through four is where we are right now. Um, we still have, don't have sufficient throughput on, on vaccinations. So we're still in this, this period of monitoring what COVID spread looks like as we continue to roll out vaccines and continue to pursue a, a, a distri distribution across the states in the United States and countries across Europe in particular. We're still awaiting what the outcomes are for the, the first 100-day agenda of the Biden administration. We've seen some indications, but we, we still haven't seen uh, any, any bills yet passed through, through Congress. Um, there's been a flurry of executive actions. That's not surprising. There's things that the, the administration can do um, irrespective of, of congressional action, like uh, 
uh, things like uh, around uh, cafe standards, the fuel efficiency standards, that's a function of the executive branch, not the legislative branch. Uh, seeing things on, on drug pricing that can be affected through Medicare purchases, which again is an executive branch authority. But taxation, uh, major spending policy, that all requires congressional uh, approval and authority. And we're still in the middle of that. And then, as I mentioned, on four, we're, we're, we're encouraged by the, the Johnson & Johnson development uh, that, that that vaccine has a much easier distribution and storage uh, uh, capability than the mRNA uh, vaccines by Pfizer and, and by Moderna. But it just adds to the it, it adds to the possibility of getting this vaccine distributed throughout uh, throughout the country and and getting to that point of, of herd immunity and being able to to uh, to reopen. And then again, as I said, we're, we're focused very much on what we call this this steady state. You know, we, there's a lot of pent up demand for for travel. I know we're all sitting here. I'm in my three season porch for season number four here in in, uh, in the city limits of, of, of Minnetonka here, even though I'm always at a zip code. And and there's there's quite a bit of pent up demand for people who want to get out and travel and and uh, and meet face to face. But the question is, what is the what do, what do consumer and business uh, trends look like for more of those durable things like where do we you know how often do we go to work? Uh, whether we meet face to face or we continue with Zoom or, or or WebEx type meetings, and what do physical footprints look like? How much office space do we need? Is it shared or what have you? So these are the things that will be we key considerations um, looking forward. So uh, can we move one more slide. Um, this is a market. Uh, so now I'm going to transition into to kind of our our uh, framework of of uh, the virus policy economy and and kind of what we see for the outlook for 2021. This is the market perception of where we are in terms of reopening. So the, the darker blue line, that's that's uh, that's the, the price index of, uh, of what's called the NASDAQ 100. So think of those like Amazon and Google and, and all those technology companies that benefit tremendously from stay at home, work from home, video streaming, um, those those uh, areas of growth that not only were, were, were perhaps not negatively impacted, but maybe had even some positive impact from the results of, of COVID-19 and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the restrictions on, on uh, individuals' activities. The lighter, uh, the lighter line, the grayish line, that's the, that's the area of the market, the smaller company area of the market, and more that what we call the value sector. So those are the companies that are probably more representative of, of having a, a severe impact from COVID. So you can see as we approach the, the, uh, the COVID crisis, they kind of moved a little bit together. Those smaller companies uh, suffered more, more more severely during the the lockdown, and have taken time to, to catch back up and not are, are, haven't quite uh, recovered fully. So this for us is just a way to visualize um, the market's perception of where we are in terms of reopening. We've had a recovery in, in some of these sectors like hospitality, but obviously in an economy where we haven't fully reopened, um, we, we haven't seen a, a full recovery in those areas of the economy. On the next slide. Is uh, is kind of where we where we thought we were maybe a month ago in terms of vaccination throughput, and where we are today. So this is just a, a chart that looks at uh, super forecasters and their predictions of how long it would be before we could inoculate the first 25 million uh, people in the United States. So back in December, there was a lot of optimism that gray line that we would uh, we would achieve that uh, before the uh, the end of January, which we've we've now just passed. But you can see. Beginning in late December, we started to become less optimistic as the distribution uh, challenges emerged, as, as we, we had challenges with, with getting mRNA vaccines uh, throughout, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country and, 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 uh, and getting those inoculations. They were now looking more like a first half of 2021 to, to get the number of vaccines necessary to reopen the economy. On 19, this is, this is the daily vaccine. Uh, uh, one more slide, uh, Andrea. We can go one more slide from that. That's just a, a slide of, of, of states. Um, so this is the case growth of, uh, of uh, the virus throughout the world. You can see, and uh, as we got through the holidays, we got that giant spike up. Um, that was a function of, of growth in South America, but also the United States and Europe. And we've now had a meaningful re retracement of, of virus growth as we've, we've passed the holidays. But this is still at a level that that, that challenges uh, reopening. It still makes it uh, necessary to have activity restrictions. Um, but this will be key now as we get to Lunar New Year and those countries around the world that celebrate that, whether we get a, a bump up. But you can just see the pretty sharp rise we had post-holiday. Uh, that, that, that was that spike up to almost 800,000 cases a day. And now we've fallen back materially from there. On, on the next slide on 22, 
Um, this just shows you regionally, the United States in the dark blue line, Europe and, and Japan in the, in the gray line. And then the, the onset of the virus in, in Asia, China, uh, Korea, Taiwan at all. You can see Asia's actually had a much more muted uh, recovery and virus growth. This is the area of the world economy that's, that's recovered pretty quickly. This is manufacturing Asia. That's the part of the world that, that manufactures a lot of the goods. And we've really transitioned from, from a services uh, type global economy to a goods economy. I'll show you that in some of the manufacturing numbers. But the manufacturing side of the world economy has actually recovered pretty strongly. And we've seen that in the economies of, of what we call emerging Asia. Um, and we haven't seen that quite so much in the United States and, and Europe and Japan. 23, the next slide, this is, this is, we've shared this with you in the past. This is kind of how we contextualize the thousands of, of economic data series that we, we look at globally. We categorize them into whether they're above or below their long-term average and whether the data is getting better or getting worse. So you can think of this like a, a visualization of an economic cycle where you start in the Southwest, you start in you know, sort of Arizona, California, if you think of this as a map of the country. And the bottom left is the data is weak and it continues to, to worsen. So that's what we would consider a classic recessionary environment. And as the data improves, even though it's, it's not fully uh, uh, you know, back to normal, that's what we call a recovery where the, 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 uh, the most recent data is, is improving relative to where it had been over the last year. And as the data gets, gets back above its long-term average and continues to get better, that's what we call an expansion. And then as that data starts to slow down, so you go through this cycle of going around and around in a, in a clockwise fashion. And I put on the actual change from the last presentation that we had. So you can see about a third of the data points. So out of a thousand data series, you know, well over 300 have migrated from, from being in this sort of recession slowdown area to being in this area where you've, you've now recovered. And again, a lot of that's in, in places like emerging Asia and China, Korea, Taiwan. But it's also, also we see that in the goods producing or manufacturing areas of countries all over the world. So that's where we've seen most of the preponderance of the improvement in the data. On the next slide, you can see visually this is kind of a map through time, um, which the first dot would be two years. Think of, think, think of this as two years ago at the presentation that we had, and the middle dot would be last year's presentation, and the, and the, the last dot where the arrow is is where we are currently. So you can see globally, We've migrated where the data was incredibly weak uh, back in Mar March, April, May. It's improved, so the data is getting better, meaning it moved up into that northwest quadrant, that recovery quadrant. But the data hasn't shown, and we, we, we can see this anecdotally or, or, or know this just uh, organically, that we haven't gotten back to a fully expansionary economy. We haven't reopened. Um, the service economy is nowhere back to where, where, uh, where it had been pre-COVID but at least the data has improved relative to where it had been a year ago. So the, the, the world has kind of evolved into this recovery sector, which we think has been feeding into what we've seen in, in capital markets performance. On the next slide, Andrea, this, this just shows that the United States has been really no, no different than the rest of the world. Again, about a third of the data points from a year ago have migrated up into either that recovery or, or that expansionary part of, the, part of the economy. The key then will be as we get through the first half of this year, but those those data points will look pretty good relative to activity a year ago, but when we get to the second half of next year, um, we, we we need to see as material recovery in the economy in order to continue to support what we see in the capital market. So we need to see the real economy kind of pick up, not just look good relative to the to the weak state we were in a year ago. Twenty six. This is just a, a similar perspective on on the housing market. Just gives you a sense of how we look at the data at various segments. Housing market, so the tan line is where we were pre-COVID, just maybe right after we, we met last year. But the housing market was in pretty good shape. Uh, we, prices had stopped rising significantly, um, but activity was pretty good. And now post-COVID, the housing market has been one of the key pillars of strength in the U.S. economy. So builders' confidence remains at or near all-time highs. We've seen strong growth in prices as we have tremendous demand for single-family homes with challenged supply that's driven up prices. And we've seen everything from construction activity to sales activity to, to financial activity, meaning applications for mortgages, uh, hold up really well. So the housing market continues to be a, a, an area of, of strength in the economy. The consumer, on the other hand, on 27, we get mixed messages here on the, on the consumer um, where um, confidence obviously has taken a material hit from where we were a year ago, where people are, are, are challenged by, you know, where are we with school, uh, back to school, 
It makes it challenging to try to figure out what, what work life looks like if, if kids aren't back to school. Um, we, we don't yet know what even back to work looks like. So confidence obviously has, had taken a hit relative to a year ago. We've got some conflicting data in terms of, of where we are retail, but what we've seen through, through our work and the work of our, our equity strategy group on individual companies is just this change in consumer behavior and, and, and a year of online ordering, um, either, either you know, in-home delivery or, or pickup at stores. Um, the, the retail activity actually held up pretty well, but you can see the areas of the economy and, and, the, and the retail sector that were materially hit were, were autos, and then up in particular, you know, not surprisingly, the, the restaurants uh, with, with the challenges of, of uh, activity restrictions. On next slide on 28, we look at relative to where we were a year ago, we, we started looking at a lot of higher frequency indicators uh, to see you know, to where progress is on on reopening. So we look at everything from restaurant seatings that uh, through open table data to TSA information on, on travel. And what we, what we know, and it's not surprising, it's pretty obvious in our economy, is that we're well below levels that we would consider a, a normal economy. So we're still two thirds below what a normal uh, traffic environment looks like on, on airlines. And in relative to the airlines, you know, probably the first thing to pick up um, as we as we get through through vaccinations and a reopening will be consumer travel. So so people traveling for leisure. The question will be what does business travel look like? And for some of the airlines, that's that's the the, the most important uh, profitability metric for them, which is which is business travel. And it's an open question what that looks like in a in a post COVID world. Um, we can fast forward uh, to to slide thirty. Um, this is what we're looking at in terms of of, uh, of corporate America. This is the, the, the growth in earnings relative to a year ago. This is globally, this is not just the, the United States economy, but the same story is the, it's the same all over the world. It's just the scale is different, which is Q4, we started to see a pickup in, in, in corporate earnings relative to a year ago. We're gonna have very easy comparisons for, for Q1 and Q2. So those numbers are gonna look really good. Um, that's, that's very well known and very well telegraphed that we're gonna see tremendous growth in earnings relative to the collapse we saw in 2020. But then the question is, what is 2021 in the back half and 2022? What does that organic growth or that real growth look like when we're past this, this sort of comparison with, a, with a, where we were in a, in a severely constrained COVID economy last year? But what does normal growth look like? And then, therefore, what are investors willing to pay for, for normal earnings growth? So that's, that's where we're looking at in terms of the back half of, of next year. On 32, we'll, we'll kind of get through some of the inflation numbers, and then I'll do a little bit on the global, on the U.S. or the Minnesota economy, and then we'll we'll open it up for for questions and, and any comments that you might have. But a question we get all the time is is where is inflation? If that that chart on the Federal Reserve showed you how much money that they've they've put into the system, uh, we have the CARES Act, we've got the Biden administration's proposal for a 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus package. Um, why, why are we not seeing inflation uh, globally or, or even in the United States? In part because you know, the, 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 the capacity of, of, for, for manufacturing remains pretty high relative to demand. So we have a lot of capacity to absorb yet. And also because not a lot of that money is finding its way into the real economy. So the slide I showed you on, on the growth in credit, um, it's that, that money is not finding its way into the banking sector, leveraged in loans to, to businesses and individuals and finding its way into purchases of goods and services in excess of what we're able to generate in terms of, of, of manufacturing capacity. So we're not yet seeing inflation rise. We're seeing it uh, individually. If you look at surveys of businesses and particularly the manufacturing economy, input prices of certain things are, are becoming uh, uh, an issue, whether it's commodity prices, we're seeing food price inflation, but in general, we're not seeing the kind of inflation that gets the Federal Reserve's attention that, that, that gets them to, to reverse their position on interest rate policy. So two of those lines you can see below, the look, it looks like the light blue and maybe the, the, the darker red, those are actual measures of inflation. That's what the Federal Reserve looks at, whether it's the CPI index, the consumer price index, or the personal consumption expenditure index. The Federal Reserve's target for that is 2%. So you can see it's way below 2% as it, as it stands. There are a couple of inflation measures above the 2% line. Those are market expectations of what inflation may look like five years from now. So market participants are starting to price in the possibility of, of inflation rising over the next five years as this, as this stimulus continues to, to uh, 
flow through the economy as we do recover and as we do start to to absorb that excess capacity. But this is an important uh, uh, metric that that uh, we are watching. The Fed's watching. This would have a material impact on on interest rates in the United States, which would again have a material impact on on the on the, uh, the, the cost of Treasury yields and our borrowing costs as a country. So that's that's another key that we're looking for. Um, 33, we're, what we're seeing is, is a, uh, a recovery in, in terms of long-term interest rates relative to short rates. Uh, this is what's called the slope of the yield curve, which is the difference between longer-term interest rates and shorter-term. Every time that those, those rates converge or, or shorter-term rates become more expensive than long-term, uh, that's portended a recession that, that, that uh, we saw that again in this, in this most recent episode. But now we're seeing long-term interest rates rise relative to short. That's that's a positive for the financial sector, um, which is the sector that depends on on uh, deposit rates being being lower than than mortgage rates and and other lending rates. So we're starting to see a recovery um, in the difference in in long-term rates relative to short. So that's a positive uh, influence on on the uh, sort of the credit-producing sector of of the economy. And again. Uh, uh, pretend perhaps to to a recovering economy in the second half in the uh, second half of next year. That's pretty much it on on some of the formal comments on on the economy. On 36, I just would, would kind of close the the the, uh, the national economy. On this is this is the the budget outlook. This has changed materially post COVID with the CARES Act and would change once again um, after the passage of, of of the next fiscal round. But you can see that that as a projection. Um, we continue to certainly add debt relative to the size of our economy. And when this becomes an issue is when the financing cost of that debt um, really starts to eat into the economic growth or the growth of the economy is just not sufficient to, to grow into this into this debt. So we continue to, to add to the deficit, which is not surprising given the, the, the counter cyclical um, uh, function of, of fiscal deficits in a, in a, in a uh, uh, recessionary economy. But as the economy recovers, it will be it will be a, a key area of focus whether we pull back on that monetary and fiscal stimulus, and and begin to to flatten out this curve as the economy grows grows into this debt. So this is this is key to watching what what happens with inflation and, and interest rates. But for right now, um, we're not seeing that in, get the impact in terms of what what uh, demand for U.S. Treasuries is is asking for in terms of the yield on on U.S. Uh, treasuries. There's still significant demand for our government debt. We're able to finance this this, this debt at, at incredibly low financing costs, but again, that'll be key going forward. Uh, we'll go all the way to 40, and and Andrew's just been so patient with me to to drive. I, I really appreciate it. But locally, um, as far as inflation goes, we're seeing the same the same kind of features in in uh, in Minnesota that we're seeing, and in Minneapolis that we're seeing nationally, which is just inflation remains muted in line with what we're seeing nationally. And not yet a concern that that uh, that we need to reverse our our monetary policy due to to sharply rising inflation. On 41, historically Minneapolis has had a lower uh, unemployment rate than than uh, than nationally. You can see that the spike in unemployment was was severe, but but less so in Minneapolis relative to the national average. And in Minneapolis, we've actually gotten back to maybe the higher end of this this unemployment range. Whereas nationally, we, we continue to to uh, have this sort of persistently high level of, of unemployment relative to other metro markets on, on, on the next slide on 42. Again, historically, the Twin Cities has been below other markets like Denver, Milwaukee and Chicago. That remains the case today. Um, Sioux Falls is, is, uh, is, is one market where you've, you've almost come all the way back to where you were pre, pre-COVID. But again, relative to other metro areas, Minneapolis has, has held up held up fairly well on 43 um, house prices. We, I, sh- I showed you in, in the housing slide have, have, have moved sharply higher. Um, we've, we've seen that here in Minneapolis. It's been a feature nationally, but in Minneapolis, that impacts the, the affordability of, of housing on 44. You've seen this dip in, in what uh, is the affordability index. This is the percentage of homes that would be considered affordable for a, a median family income. You can see Minneapolis remains a, a pretty affordable place to live even uh, even irrespective of the recent rise in housing prices. But relative to nationally, Minneapolis continues to be a, a fairly affordable place. But you can see that house appreciation due to strong demand and limited supply of single family homes is starting to drive that that uh, that uh, metric lower nationally and is starting to make it challenging for, 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 for people to be able to uh, afford a home. So 
On 46, I'll close with my formal comments. And, and the bottom line, again, is just we've, we've had this glass half full mentality. When we look at the scales, when we put them on the, on the scales, when we look at the risks of, of policy missteps or, or challenges to vaccination throughput, or even challenges from, from the potential for mutations in the virus to, to, uh, to make it challenging for, for current vaccines to uh, offset that. We still believe that, that uh, medical progress and the Federal Reserve's ongoing uh, commitment to um, stimulative monetary policy kind of weighs a little bit heavier on those scales. Progress on the vaccine and progress on vaccination throughput is absolutely critical. That's, that's key behind reopening the economy. And then for us, um, the, the, for the second half of the year, uh, we, we continue to like things like equities and, and real assets. But relative to, to real estate, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly been a, a kind of a bifurcated market. You've got things like cell towers, single family home rentals, industrial warehouses based on this, this uh, kind of the Amazonification of the economy of, of buying online and shipping to home. Um, you've got a lot, you know, continue to have a lot of strong growth in the real estate sectors there, data centers home builders, even things like uh, the medical community, laboratory space at all. Um, the areas of the real estate market we think uh, are maybe just uh, challenged temporarily, but but uh, we think still have uh, strong potential going forward. We, you know, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm part of this too, but student housing, I mean, the, the students will go back to school at some point. I've got three kids in college. Um, they're living at home right now, but, but starting in the fall, I've, I've expected my two uh, University of Minnesota students and my St. Cloud State uh, law enforcement student will go back to school, but student housing, uh, things like senior housing, uh, perhaps even apartments are, are an area where in, in, in real estate and environment have the potential to recover. And the question then will be what happens in those secularly challenged markets of, uh, of real estate, like office and shopping centers, hotels, movie theaters. And we don't think we have a lot of clarity yet on what that looks like and what consumer trends and, and what business trends look like. But I'm happy to take any questions here. That's that's kind of the, the, the perspective of what we see for, for 2021. And, and uh, uh, again, just happy to, to see if we have any questions that I can answer at this time. Thank you so much. I'm John Paul Yates, the Director of Public Policy for the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. I think this is the third year we've had you join us um, to do this event. You always do a really great job. Um, I'm gonna guide us through the Q&A portion here. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, I did want to start with a question, kind of news of the day. We've seen this retail trading frenzy um, with GameStop, American Airlines, other stocks. I'm wondering if you can offer some perspective on that and then maybe touch on what do you think the ramifications or repercussions <laughs> from that will be from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, thanks, John. Paul, um, our perspective has, has, has been a couple of things. One is Anytime you get greater participation in, in, in capital markets, it's a good thing. Anytime you get more people participating in a market, it, it, it broadens out um, the participants um, from, from the perspective specifically of the stocks and the price action and the people investing. Our, our perspective is, as, you know, you know, we work on behalf of our clients. Our perspective has always been you know, allocating your money to make sure that's in line with your risk tolerance and goals and objectives. So. You know that's that's a, a question for for what uh, you know individual investors are doing, regarding you know the 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 uh, the, the actual you know, impact of markets. We think it's pretty transitory. Um, it, it was you know, obviously a pretty severe impact on individual stocks, whether it was GameStop or or some of those classic you know, bad BlackBerry, Nokia. There were there were a lot of those sort of 90s consumer companies that that, that uh, were, were were part of this. And they had some material impact on individual funds and on individual investors. But in general, you saw capital markets just kind of, you know, the bond market did nothing. The capital markets kind of recovered from some of the volatility, which, which suggests to us that there's not a, 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 a tremendous uh, uh, injury or, 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 or you know, repair that's necessary in the markets. But it does beg the question on a regulatory uh, scale of, of things like how much short interest can you allow in companies, you know, how much can you be allowed to borrow short against the company? And so these are things that Janet Yellen and the regulatory authorities are going to look at to see if there's any parts of the market that this pointed out that that needs some 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 additional rules or regulations around. And and that's that's you know we think that's probably highly likely as a as a result. But in terms of what happened, I mean, my, my kids came home. It was the first thing they talked about after they got you know, they came home. They came downstairs from from studying. But 
it was pretty interesting that that you know, any any twenty something year old you could you could you could talk to knew everything about what was going on with GameStop and, and Reddit and Robinhood, and it just tells us that you've got a, a, a age cohort that's becoming very engaged in what goes on in the, in the, in the markets. And to us, we think that's a good thing. And we think it also is important then to, to, to make sure that people are, are you know, allocating their, 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 their capital and their investments in the way it's commensurate with their, with their risk and with their goals. Sure. Thank you. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask, and then I'll get to a audience question here is, you often see the markets react pretty strongly when a new administration comes into office. I don't know that we've necessarily seen that. I wanted to ask you one, why do you think that is? And then two, what things are you tracking in a Biden administration as you look forward um, from an economic outlook standpoint? Yeah, so it was interesting because if you looked at the prediction market, the the, the ultimate scenario wasn't wasn't necessarily factored in. So the, the outcome we got, which was a, a democratic sweep, which was a, a, a democratic victory in the in the presidential election, and at least a, a tie in the Senate, which then gave the Democrats the, the advantage via via the uh, the tie breaking vote for for the vice president. Um, but as we got closer and closer to that, as we got closer to understanding what the potential policy uh, platform of of a democratic sweep looked like, it it, it uh, I think the, the capital market participants became less concerned about what that what that might look like. Um, there was greater clarity that this was going to be the outcome eventually. And so and we've seen this historically, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of, of capital market movements, depending on whether you have continuation uh, in government or, or a changeover in government. It's really what the state of the economy is. And so again, the perspective has been, we know we're in this constrained economy. We have optimism about vaccine throughput. The election gave us some clarity that we were at least gonna, you know, we could perceive some policy stimulus coming out of a Democrat controlled Congress. But then in Trump market, we're still waiting to see what the impacts are on specific policy. How's that gonna affect the energy sector, for example? How's that gonna affect the financial services sector or other specific parts of the economy? But in general, I think there was this optimism that vaccine throughput plus fiscal stimulus plus the Fed was going to carry through. It didn't you know, didn't matter that there was this Democratic sweep and the and the uh, and the assumption of the of the Biden administration and, and the Democrat control of Congress. Cool. Thank you, um, Jennifer Rogers asked a question: Which industries do you see um, are still strong presently? And if I can add to it, maybe what weathered and you you talked on, on this a little bit, but what weathered. Um, the pandemic, but maybe what's also positioned really strongly right now. Yeah, we've, we've always had a perspective of the long-term opportunities and things like technology and healthcare. Um, and then we've seen through COVID-19, the, 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 the development of genomics as, as a, both kind of a technology and, and, a, and a healthcare breakthrough and how quickly that became part of the solution. But uh, everything. The other thing we saw is that is you know, typically you get adoption of certain technologies on what's called like this S curve, where you know there's early adopters and then there's mass adoption. We saw a really shortening of that. So think of, of WebEx and, and Zoom and how quickly we all adapted to that, both professionally and personally. And the companies that that that, that stood to benefit of that you know, held up extremely well through this process. And the, Again, are positioned pretty well long term. If, if this is part and parcel of the fabric of our of our of our life, our daily life, and our and our work life, the areas of the economy that were that were impaired that that we see opportunity in currently are what we call the reopen. So, as I mentioned in in the, the presentation, that chart that showed the area of the economy that that represents um, the reopening sectors. So, things that will go back to some some form of normalcy, similar to what we were pre pre COVID. So um, you know, when we can go back to face-to-face -to -face interactions, when you can go back to a restaurant, when you can go back to things that we typically had done prior to COVID, there's an opportunity for those parts of the more the cyclically oriented sectors uh, of the economy to, to recover. So we, we, we think those are, 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 are interesting areas currently for, for more of a, of a, they didn't do well during last year, but we think there's opportunity for, for, for 2021. The areas that we'll, we'll, we think are, are still challenged, where we don't have a lot of clarity, as I mentioned, in particular, are real estate and, and what, what retail looks like and what hotel looks like and what office looks like. We still don't think we have clarity on that. 
we think we get a recovery in personal travel, but business travel, we, we don't know what the percentage is of how much even you know, personally we go back to traveling and how much is more of a hybrid of face-to-face. So I would say that the, the, the technology and healthcare sectors, robotics, um, you know, the, the, what we used to call the internet of things, but, but smart device, like everything that communicates in real time, um, that, that adoption was, was sped up pretty significantly. Cybersecurity, the, all the hacks that we hear about, um, those are kind of those secular growth areas, the cyclical areas of recovery of what we're looking at now, and then there's, there's still those challenged areas that we think there's, there's less clarity going forward. Yep, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Julie's asking, with so many service workers forecast to have their positions not return, what retraining opportunities do we see in, in a recovered economy? Yeah, that's a that's a that's an interesting question about what how do we and and this this goes to what we see in in the jobs number. We're going to get another jobs number tomorrow from from the federal government. Um, we got the numbers from unemployment uh, claims today, um, but there's this sort of persistent uh, unemployment now. This sort of structural unemployment where where people um, are, are start to be out of jobs for 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 extended periods of time. And this is one of the keys for where why we think the Federal Reserve is going to stay pretty pretty accommodative for for a really long time, which is that's that's a significant part of the economy that that has to be repaired. Which is where do we get these service, specifically service sector workers in areas that may may not reopen? I mean, the question is like what happens at downtown, and and you know how many of us go back to downtown full time, and all those service sector businesses that that supported the downtown economy, and 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 if those don't recover fully. What, where do those workers go and how do we retain them? So I would expect that that gets to be a lot of the conversation around the fiscal package uh, within within Congress about retraining um, part of the stimulus package. We, we think it's to be focused then on not just sort of these broad, you know, handing out, a, handing out checks to individuals, but how do you support a retraining economy and get people back to work? Great, Tom, thank you. Thanks again for your time, your wisdom. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, Jonathan Weinhagen, to wind us down. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan Weinhagen, president and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Thank you all for being with us today. And, and Tom, thank you for an incredible program. And thanks to U.S. Bank for your partnership throughout the year. I also want to give a shout out to Starbucks. They, uh, they power my morning every day with Pike Place. Uh, so super fun to have them engaged in this series. You know, we talk to business owners every day who have been hit hard by this pandemic and who have been reeling by the last 10 months of what everyone has experienced. Um, but we consistently hear the theme that Tom shared today and that's a theme of optimism. And I loved that glass half full framing uh, that US Bank and, and you and your team, Tom, have been you know, pushing forward. And I think that's exactly what we need to be thinking about. At the Chamber, we're bullish about the future of the Great OSP region. We know that you know, a decade ago, coming out of the Great Recession, we outpaced our peers with regards to the economic recovery, and we believe we can do that again. We have all of the tools in place and all of the leadership, um, and, and that's what we're charging to do. You know, Tom highlighted a number of industries that, that are thriving, um, industries that are kind of, you know, unsuspectingly, you know, outpacing uh, a pandemic. And we're seeing every day the leadership of companies, they're pivoting, they're innovating, um, they're leading the way, they're leading the way of our economic recovery. Uh, and we, we are grateful for that. We left an economy um, that was, you know, facing historically low unemployment, you know, everybody was hunting for talent. We're emerging into an economy that's more about job creation, and we know that. Um, and we're thinking about how do we help build the next generation of jobs. Late last year, the Chamber created Elevate Business um, within the Chamber's foundation, a public-private partnership with Hennepin County to help bring technical assistance resources, peer-to-peer -peer networking, and topical webinars like this to the business community, all with the idea of creating opportunity for companies to grow and to thrive in our region today, over 700 businesses are on that platform leveraging the tools. And we believe the next you know, 10,000 jobs are in that cohort of companies that, uh, that are receiving business and services. Uh, 
it's the leadership of our, our private sector, of our, our business community that's gonna drive us forward. So I wanna you know, close the program by thanking all of you, not just for being here, but for the work you do, the risks that you take. Um, you really are the, the economic vibrancy of this market that we are so fortunate to be able to, to celebrate together. So thanks to all of you for, for being here. Thanks again to Tom for, uh, for the incredible insights into the year ahead. We will do a check back again next year and see, see where we are 365 days from now. Um, with that, uh, we'll close the program. Thanks everyone, have a great day.